What is up, guys? It's BKVT, British Kid VT, right here. And we back with MMA Talk 101. Last time I did an MMA Talk video, my belly, I couldn't even see my wee wee when, when I was peeing. When I was washing my ass, couldn't even see my wee wee. Well, you know, now I'm all skinny mini and, you know, starting and stuff. But whatever. This is MMA Talk 101, and I forgot which episode this is because it's been so long. But I just got finished watching a beastly main event coming out of UFC 157 Rousey vs. Carl Moose. And the reason why it was beastly wasn't even because of Rousey and Carl Moose throwing down. The reason why is because Rousey was about to have a nip slip. Her titties were about to pop out her bra. And you know, I'm sitting here, um, what you call it? Carl Moose had her in the face crank, a standing face crank choke. And Rousey tits just about to pop out, pop out. Like you see it, the friction is going against the bra. You're like, yes, pop, 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 pop. You know, he's, I'm sitting here doing the Daniel Bryan, yes, yes, chant. You know, just pop out, pop out. And then all of a sudden, she escapes the face crank. And then she like fixes her bra and stuff. Like, that's some Illuminati shit. It's, the government is watching over so Rousey don't be a nipsy. But whatever, it, it, um, the fight was great. So, what I'm about to do here is um, basically go over each fight. Uh, one on the prelims in the home main card and how great the fighter say, uh, you know, where should they go from there and stuff like that. So this is basically a post, post, event, recap, slash, analysis, whatever you want to call it. So I'm going to pick off one fight, which is basically against the two most famous people out of the whole prelim, which is Brendan Shaw versus LeVar Johnson. Now, first of all, going into this fight, I thought LeVar Johnson was going to win. You know, I completely disregarded that he was horrible off his back. He was horrible defending the takedown. And that Brendan Shaw would actually try and take him down. But as in MMA knowledge, as you prepare for a fight, you gotta uh, display your opponent's weakness. You know, you gotta capitalize on that. I really forgot about that. So Shaw, all Shaw really did was just take him down. Uh, had him on his back, didn't do so much damage or anything like that. To tell you the truth, Brendan Shaw was really just trying to save his job. Because he's really been on like a, a funk lately. Um, did he just recently lose to Ben Rothwell? Yeah, he recently lost to Ben Rothwell and uh, Minotaur and O'Gara. So, and it was both by KO, and it was the type of KO where he was dominating, you know, on his way to a win, and then boom, you know, he just knocked out. I always thought that like, he should go down a light heavyweight. I don't see him messing with John Jones, but he could probably have a better career there than he would at heavyweight. And plus, him and John Jones train for Greg Jackson, so I really don't see that happening if they're butt bodies. But, um, yeah, I really thought winning Shaw... I mean, LeVar Johnson was just going to dismantle Shaw. If not dismantle him, it would be where Shaw is on his way to a win, like, once again. And then LeVar just comes out of nowhere. Go punch! And then, you know, Shaw is just on the ground and he needs Mike real. So, where should Shaw go from here? I think Shaw should fight Frank Neal. I'm not quite convinced that Brendan Shaw has a defined takedown scheme, you know. You can't really... Uh, see and great that if it's against a fighter like LeVar Johnson because LeVar is like a turtle on his back he just can't get up so let's put him against Frank Mir you know Frank Mir is a whiz off his back and is more he's got a really short will have to be more alert if he was to take down Frank Mir out wheel you know he can't just lay on him and look at the clock or we could give him the Travis Brown you know Travis Brown is coming off a loss top heavyweight prospect I think Silver got lucky against him because he uh, hurt his thigh or leg in the middle of the fight. But Brown has uh, got a solid stand-up game. He's powerful. That, that would make for an interesting fight. As for LeVar Johnson, this wouldn't really make too much sense since Roy Nelson is kind of on a tear. But I don't see LeVar lasting too long with the company. 
So you might as well just give him Roy Nelson to have a, you know, a, a goodbye fight. You know, a fight where you'll be like, okay, these two are going to stand up. Someone's going to get knocked out. It's nothing like that. But that most likely won't happen because they won't just put a fighter who's doing gold, you know, make someone fight lower competition like that. You can have them welcome Shane Carwin back to the cage, you know, Carwin has been sidelined with injuries for a while and I guess a good warm up fight would be against Laval Johnson. Or you could have him welcome Chet Congo and you know let's just face it that would make for a fight for whatever. So with that said we will go on to the next fight. Robbie Lawler versus Josh Koscheck. Going into this fight I wanted Koscheck to win and I really thought Koscheck would pull out the win because he has an established wrestling game and his stand up is not too bad. Robbie Lawler is known for his depth of fighting stand up, but he does not have great takedown defense. Now, um, in the first two rounds, not the first two rounds, in the first round, like the start of the fight, Kolschek was utilizing that takedown, you know, he was taking him down, and it, it was pretty easy, but then all of a sudden, Robbie Lawler just lands a few punches on the ground and that's it. A lot of people might say it's an early stoppage, but I'm gonna be the type of guy that'll be like this. If he was to land more punches, you would it would have been a definite stoppage. So I say good stoppage or whatever. It was it was fun. Um, as for Koscheck, who should I? I don't. I'm kind of confused on who Koscheck should fight. I would say to cut him mainly because his time is over. You know, as he's one of my favorite welterweights, but his time is over, man. Um, the whole, after the whole GSP era, like him fighting him, going on the tear to get the GSP, he's just like, fell off. Um, he's fell off, and I, I actually do think he got robbed against Hendricks and Pearson, but I still think Koscheck fell off, and it would be the right time to cut him, or put him on the prelim card. As for Robbie Lola, you know, step him up in competition. He could probably welcome Tariq Safadin to the cage because he was like the most recent strike force where to wait before they shot down. He could probably welcome him. Okay, so Court McGee versus Josh Neer. Going into this fight, I seen Josh Neer win because this was Court McGee's where to wait debut. But before he lost to Costa Philippu at middleweight. Philippu is a big menacing middleweight, and really all he did the whole fight was just uh, pound on Court McGee. And you know, he didn't necessarily do damage, but he was just so aggressive and you know, just landing so much that Court McGee couldn't do anything. So I thought, you know, being a fighter Josh Near is, his little balls to wall persona and just going in with punches and flurries, I thought it would overwhelm Court McGee and Court McGee wouldn't really be able to do anything. But he shot me up and he got a dominant unanimous decision win over Josh Near. As for that, I think Court McGee should probably fight Mark, Martin Cartman. Martin Cartman, you know, Martin Cartman coming off a loss. And this would be a real test to see if Court McGee at welterweight is a menace or is it just something that's garbage. Either that or he could welcome, be another one of those fighters to welcome Tyreek Safadine to the cage. You know, uh, you can warm Safadine up to a fighter like Court McGee, you know, you don't have to start him out with the big names. But uh, as for Josh Neer, who should Josh Neer fight? Um, Josh Neer is on the dreaded three fight list. Now usually when you get on that you get cut. And the UFC is on a cutting speed right now. But Josh Neer is also another one of those exciting fighters that Dana White likes to keep around. Because they bring in the fights that bring in these casual fans. And these people that like seeing you know, two men in the cage just knock each other's head off. But I think a good next fight for him would be Dan Hart. You know, this is a man that no matter what, he's going to stand up. And Josh Neer would be proud to stand up with. So if Josh Neer was to lose, yeah, you know, you gotta cut him. Uh, it would be a good way to go out. And if he was to win, then you know, it's a good fight. You could schedule another fight with him. Uh, Uriah Faber versus Ivan Minjabar. Going into this fight, I knew Uriah Faber was going to win. You know, this is typical Uriah Faber stuff. And I actually like Faber, but this is typical stuff, man. He'll win a fight or two. 
they'll put them up against the top contender or not even a top contender but somebody who's in line to fight for the title he'll get dominated by that person or he won't even do anything to like uh solidify himself uh, he won't even really put up a fight and then after that they'll have him face somebody who's like in the lower mid card not as good but you can obviously fate see favor with dominating and um that's exactly what he did he in the first round he locked on a rear naked choke and just tapped out uh hyper minge ball and it was 30 seconds left like some 30 to 20 seconds left but where should they go from here? I think Faber should welcome Scott Jorgensen to the cage. Jorgensen uh, did beastly in his last fight. He's coming off a win. Faber's coming off a win. You know, let's see him clash. What you got, Faber? And um, as for Ivan Minjavar, I think he should go. This would probably not be a good idea, but Michael McDonald. You know, Ivan Minjavar is not that bad of a fighter. He's kind of exciting. He's not all. Uh, takedowns and all that. Michael McDonald also has power in his hands. It would make for an interesting fight. So, you know, maybe put him up against Michael McDonald. Bring, try and make Michael McDonald rise back up in the ranks again. Uh, Leonardo Machida versus Dan Hindo Henderson. Uh, going into this, I, these are my two favorite fighters in light heavyweight. And going into this, I seen Leonardo win it. Because what people don't understand, wait, I got a burp for a second, hold on, hold on, what a nice burp. But what people don't understand is that Dan Henderson is not the man he used to be. Don't let the fight of the night performances with Shogun fool you, you know, don't let that fool you. I kind of seen the change in Dan Henderson when he fought Rafael Cavalcante in strike force. He got rocked by one of his knees. And then he was being taken down like twice by Cabo Conte. Dan Henderson went from being the guy that had superb wrestling and striking with an iron chin to a guy that looks for that one punch to knock you out with pretty good wrestling and a chin that's wearing down even though he can still take a lot of punches. So I kind of knew the hinder that was coming into this fight. I didn't expect H-Bomb, Machida out, oh blah blah. You know, I expected what came out of this fight. Machida circling around while Dan Henderson was continuously trying to look for the H-Bomb, look for the H-Bomb, still couldn't get it. You know, he'll charge in for Flurry but it wouldn't prove anything. The scorecards, I did not see this as a split decision. You can call me an idiot, a stupid ass, it doesn't matter. I see this as a unanimous 29-28 decision. Or 30-27 for um, Leodo Machida. But uh, had Hendo won and he would have faced Jones, Jones would have made a bigger monkey. He would have landed those shots, gassed out Hendo so he wouldn't even be able to do those flurries in the second and third round. So... Good thing Leoto won. Maybe he can provide for a better fight against John Jones. And for the last fight, Ronda almost slipping out her titties, Rousey versus Liz looking like Uriah Faber Commons. Going into this fight, I thought it was like this. Okay, Ronda Rousey, women's division. They're trying to build Ronda Rousey up as like a pioneer women's MMA. They're trying to make her seem like she's a god. So they're going to feed her another wrestler because since wrestlers like going to the ground and Ronda Rousey likes an armbar, you know, that's an easy win and she can do it in the first round and keep breaking records. Oh boy, was I wrong. Liz Carmouche went in there, you know, she was avoiding the armbar for a bit. She came in there with the rear naked choke standing up. She was about to finish. Ronda Rousey face was turning purple. She was looking crazy. And her nipples was about to fall out. I was like, oh, yes, yes, I might bust a load. And all of a sudden, she breaks it. She breaks that shit. And then right after that, Ronda Rousey gets into an armbar and she solidifies the win. Oh, and by the way, for Leota Machida and Dan Henderson, I think that Machida should, well, he will face John Jones and John make the fight, and Hendo should fight the winner of Gustafson versus Musasi. But back to Rousey versus Carl Moosh. Now, for Rousey, I think she'll most likely get the winner of Misha Tate, and what will also make for a great promoting fight would be Sarah McMahon. She's also another Olympian, not the UFC sign, you know, they could promote it like Olympian versus Olympian, blah, blah, you know, they was the right for this, that would be cool. 
As for Liz Carmu, she put on a good performance against Ronda Rousey, the best performance out of all her seven fights, six fights, whatever. But as for Carmu, I think she would be the one that probably get the winner and should take because she almost put Ronda out. So, uh, yeah, guys, that was basically this episode of MMA Talk 101. With the next episode, I will be giving you MMA news and my predictions on UFC 158. When GSP takes on, don't be scared, homie, Nick Diaz. So, with that said, BKB2, Bridge Kid, V2. <laughs>